Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today, where uh, to the discussion today on the critiques of the general recommendation 38, which is on trafficking on women and girls. My name is Pooja, and I have the immense privilege today to introduce all of you to the brilliant panelists we have and to have this discussion on general recommendation uh, 38 of the CEDAW committee. The, I, we had the idea behind this panel was to have it as, um, as, in, as informal and as uh, to, to facilitate discussion on this GR, well, as informal as Zoom will allow us. So we hope to have an engaging discussion on this. And we have the brilliant set of speakers who will be talking about this general recommendation in uh, and various facets of its general recommendation and how it impacts rights holders and how it impacts people and talk about accountability and advocacy around this GR. The general recommendation 38 on trafficking on women and girls in the context of global migration was adopted in November uh, of 2020. And it has uh, taken two years of work of, of multi, all, almost all the organizations represented who will be talking at this panel and a lot of other movements to look at how we can inform the CEDA committee around this GR and what are the different elements. As we all know, trafficking by itself is such a, a, con a, a concept and a phenomenon that, that, uh, that, uh, that approaches so many different aspects of life. It was important for this GR to highlight these various aspects. All the, uh, as I said, all the panelists today have been part of uh, the work around this. One of the issues, uh, so why, why this GR, why uh, GR on trafficking and why is it important to talk about it today? One of the fundamental issues that according to us, SRI, who I represent, which is a coalition of organizations based in different parts of the world, trafficking and the rhetoric around trafficking today has been so entrenched with uh, with using it and denying autonomy to a very many women and marginalized groups. So elimination of trafficking first and foremost for us requires women and girls to be seen as autonomous beings who hold multiple identities and experiences and not as passive victims, victims of circumstances and crime. And this unfortunately has been the way trafficking as a rhetoric is used by many states and by many organizations by almost ascribing certain identities and experiences to women without really hearing or, or, or uh, in discussions with women. So it at a fundamental level denies that autonomy. The CEDA committee, when it started to look at this uh, general recommendation had an opportunity precisely to, to de-link this concept and highlight that it is very, very important to look at trafficking from, uh, from the perspective of the women and girls in this world and persons involved and what makes it work for them and how, how do we make sure the rhetoric and the actions around it is actually informed by women and girls who are involved in this, uh, in, this traf uh, in, in trafficking. Yeah, I will slow down, thank you. Uh, one of the, uh, so what, what, what were we expecting is, a human rights-based approach to look at trafficking, which, which goes beyond crime control, which goes beyond border control, because this is trafficking in the context of global migration. What does it mean to look at how respecting, protecting, and fulfilling human rights of all persons, if we keep that as the fundamental aspect when we look at very many ways of addressing trafficking and its, uh, its impacts, then it, it automatically centers women who are affected, women who get most affected by measures that is taken to curb trafficking. But at the same time, it is not, it is also about, it is also about looking at labor migration. It is about uh, migration for labor and how it impacts. And then that automatically means looking at how the global, as the committee itself has said in the general recommendation, how global dominant economic policies 
exacerbate large scale economic inequalities between states and between individuals that manifest as labor exploitations, including by uh, corporations, public procurement office of the officials and employers. So we, ha we have to, while we're looking at trafficking, look at both the economy, the, the way the state and the economy interact with each other, how my, why migration is important and how people move. And at the center, what uh, women, how are women, how do women get affected? What is it the women who are most affected, uh, who, who are most affected, uh, how do they approach this issue? And in particular, what are the movements of women and girls who work around trafficking? How are they dealing with it? And then it means looking at the autonomy of women and girls and including uh, including all the very many difference and in particular looking at how sex worker movements across the world are, uh, are talking about the way trafficking is used and why it is necessary to decriminalize uh, sex work. In, and before, this is just a snippet of, I'm just giving a snippet of, of what our brilliant panelists will be talking about in much, much more detail. We'll be addressing each of these issues from their work in, in detail and talk about their own reading of this general recommendation and how it impacts women and girls' rights. So without, and I will not take too much time and we would rather hear from the speakers, I'll just introduce the first speaker today, who is Philister Ab Abdala, is the national coordinator of the Kenyan Sex Worker Alliance. She's the co-founder of African Sex Worker Alliance, ASWA, and one of the pioneers of sex worker movements in Africa. Philister is on the front line in creating awareness and advocating for the rights of sex workers at national, regional, and global levels, including lobbying and advocacy for policy reforms and leading in decriminalization of sex work process in Kenya. So moving on, Philister, if you could tell us what your own reading and how do you understand this GR and trafficking and how it impacts, uh, it impacts people within, from your own work, it would be good uh, and we'll move on from them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think from a side of me, what we have really advocating for as sex workers globally through NSWP and partnership of other women's movement like ERO was to make sure that this recommendation is actually removing the conflection between a sex work and trafficking. So looking at it right now, it, it has not made any difference because the conflection of trafficking and sex work is still there. Um, which explains it very difficult because when it comes to our country implementation of these recommendations, it means the law are still the laws in, in the countries are still going to be stricter on us as traffickers because they will not understand the fact that we have decided to be sex workers because we've made a choice of us being sex workers. That is one. So to me, if this comes at a country level, implementation it means my working environment is no longer going to be safe because people will be looking at me as a woman who is trafficked, not a, as a woman who has decided to be a sex worker. Then it also talks about ending demand approach whereby this speaks about criminalizing a client. So by criminalizing a client, that makes me jobless because once my client is criminalized, then it's going to be very complicated for me as a sex worker to be able to operate. It will be risky for clients to come to the places where we work or the hotspots where we work as sex workers. So this has really made, this will make our work to be very complicated because I'm sure this is one of the things that many of our countries are actually going to, uh, to, 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 to implement. Then this actually, the, this recommendation is actually excluding uh, sex workers from all other recommendations because this becomes very clear. If I am conflicted as a trafficked woman, then how do I fit into the other recommendations? So this has actually made sure that sex workers are actually excluded from all the other recommendations which are actually very important. Um, I think these recommendations has also uh, made us as sex workers to feel uh, to feel very disadvantaged or ignored or um, disrespected because we have 
had conversations in different uh, places. I was I participated in Bangkok, where sex workers sat down with different partners, and we came up with we, we draft uh, good recommendations that were going to contribute to this certain recommendation. Then we had another meeting in Nairobi again, and the same was done, and we sent. So sex workers were the only people who actually sent their set of recommendations to the CEDAW committee, which they decided uh, not to look at. So as sex workers, we feel like, was this disrespect? Is this denying an opportunity to a group of women who are actually raising uh, concerns which are very uh, important to us as a community? Uh, that is one that is coming from me. This recommendation is also denying us as women to make bodily autonomy or bodily choices because if we are coming out clearly as a CEDAW committee to say these are the recommendations that will respect women's uh, bodily choices, the choices that they make as women, then I feel like this has not worked for us as uh, women because I am denied to make my own bodily choices. I am denied to be a woman in this space. Uh, my voice has been shut down as a woman in this space. And I think we still have, we, we have done a lot. So I am not sure of what is the right channel for us as women to tell people that sex work is work. We have chosen to be who we are. We have made bodily autonomy and nobody is forcing us into this. Mm -hmm. So we really see this as one of the things that of the one of the recommendations that we've really worked hard upon. Thank you, uh, thank you, Philista, for that, uh, for that, for that uh, explanation. And indeed, sex work is work. And and what does this mean for this uh, general recommendation to to look at uh, to 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 almost deny, uh, almost not look at the bodily autonomy and the choices that's made by a group of women who are so, who are so affected. And we will be talking more about this. And it is a question that I think all of us need to constantly uh, constantly think about when we deal with uh, this uh, this issue moving on and 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 then it kind of moves further to our next panelist uh, radhika kumaraswamy who is uh, and i'm who's going to talk about her own reading of what this general recommendation means and what it means to introduce uh, Radhika Kumar Swami, she served as the UN Secretary General and as the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict from 2006 until her retirement in 2012. Earlier, from 1994 to 2003, she was the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, an independent expert attached to the UN Human Rights Commission in Geneva, in 2017, she was appointed to the UN Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar and also appointed as the member of the Secretary General's Board of Advisors and Mediation. She was privileged to be asked to deliver the Grotius Lecture of the American Association of International Law in 2013 and has re uh, received numerous honorary degrees and honors. It would be very good to hear from you, Radhika, about the how you would read this this gr and what it means coming from your own uh, from from your own experience and from your own work and what this means to the to to for rights holders to approach international uh, system as well thank you thank you very much uh, puja and thank you uh, all for uh, inviting me uh, as you know, when I was Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, it was the time the convention was actually uh, drafted. So I feel very emotionally uh, invested in this issue. When I think of trafficking, especially from the Asian region, I think of the two, the women I met and two stories in particular. The first is a story, I'll just call her M from Nepal, uh, who was a young girl in her village who had very abusive parents. And when a young man came and said he was in love with her, she uh, uh, agreed with him and left uh, Nepal with him secretly. And then she was taken to Pune and handed over to a brothel. And she found a safe to herself to Falkland Road. And then finally she was so-called uh, released and finally went back to Nepal. And when, she, when I met her, she had uh, HIV uh, and uh, was uh, not in a good condition. So that to me is a situation of sexual slavery. That is one Asian reality. 
The other is when I went to Calcutta uh, and met women of the Juba Mahila uh, Samanbe Committee who were sex workers union. They had just formed at that time. Now they're quite a large union. They began around uh, uh, issues of working together on HIV uh, AIDS, but now over time they've got uh, sort of uh, help in building up housing. They've got help in education for their children. Uh, they have done microfinance, and they're a, they're a supportive union that deals with economic benefits for its members and participation. I mean, and so. We, we had these two models within Asia and we have both of those in Asia. We must realize we have a history from, the, from medieval times of trafficking and sexual slavery. After every war, there was sexual slavery. But we also have the tradition of the Kultizan, which is in every piece of literature in Southeast, South Asia. Uh, and we would have not have art and music in South Asia if it were not for the sex worker and the Kultizan. Uh, and that we ha is, a, is a history we must own again, uh, I think. And to some extent, I think that is what um, uh, 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 that reality, from those two realities, I look at GR uh, 36. Now, there are some good points to GR 20, uh, 30, uh, 38, the effects of the uh, economic policies, uh, the analysis, uh, victims' rights, some, some of those provisions are good, the safe conditions of work, safe migration. But I find four problem areas. The first is I find that the market model of demand and supply has been superimposed on basically a model of criminal accountability, which is based what we deal with in cases of sexual slavery and trafficking. And I think the strategies against what you call curtailing demand, which may be okay in some ideal world, just go against the lived reality of many, large numbers of women around the world. Uh, I mean, women, some of them out of choice who choose sex work, but also some of them, it is part of their survival strategies, whether it's poverty or domestic abuse or war, Sometimes they can only work in domestic work, in factories, in sex work. And I have met women who did both. They worked domestic, they did domestic work during the day and in the night, they did, and basically for themselves and for, for their children. So unless we change, um, I mean, we should respect the choice that women have with their bodies. But even in that, unless we change the macro system that emanates power, violence against women, war, we cannot eliminate people's choices and survival strategies. We have to only focus on abuse and slavery-like conditions or arrangements uh, and not this, uh, this massive sweep of demand curtailment and criminalizing the process. The second area I found problematic is that it loses focus between the distinction between migration and trafficking. Traffickers fish in the sea of migration, as they say, but it is important to understand the similarities and the differences. Legal migration, human smuggling, trafficking, these are all different uh, uh, realities. And the differences vary according to consent. They're united by an existential desire for all these women to migrate but there are different levels of consent between trafficking, migration, and human smuggling. And therefore, I think it's very important if we're looking at human rights and recognizing women's subjectivity, and after all, CEDO is a human rights uh, document, to have the issue of consent center place, that women have the right to their autonomy, they have the right to, do, uh, to, uh, to choose, uh, and that only against their consent, such as what happened with M, uh, should the law step in. And um, I, think, I think unless we reclaim that human rights concern, uh, uh, which is actually the convention uh, people still think is flawed, but still it's structured around the women's right to choose. Uh, and I think uh, uh, this uh, refusal uh, to focus on that and migration and trafficking just seem to collapse into each other 
in this uh, general recommendation. And what happens in this kind of thing when consent is just put aside or right to choose is that intermediaries and state officials then start making decisions for women. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, those are not always in the women's best interest or not, not what the women want. They can be deported, but they don't really want to be deported. Uh, uh, and they, uh, and um, uh, various other things can happen to them. For example, um, uh, I have been in many situations where women have been miserable at being rescued uh, because uh, they had another desire and another decision for their lives. So this collapsing of migration and trafficking is, I think, a serious problem. The third problem area is that we have this sense of an active, intervening, surveillance-oriented role for the state. Now, my history to initially began as protecting human rights defenders. And I know that the state is not always benign especially on migrants and people of different racial origins. Now, this strategy of identification. I myself was once identified as a potential migrant worker who was being trafficked when I was younger, and it was not a pleasant experience. The immigration of officers were not skilled at PR. I felt I was a suspect. Uh, and so we have to be careful in this GR it empowers everybody, immigration officials, health officials, labor officials, public servants, civilian, everyone to basically spy on everyone to find out whether they're being trafficked. And that is not an appropriate response. Women, migrant women especially, want to be invisible. So there should be a, a better understanding of the role of the state and that it is not a benign state that we are uh, looking at. And when we are in partnership with the state as a human rights uh, group, we have to be careful as to how we look at the state and how it intervenes. And I must say, finally, the fourth problem area is I think there are some um, good provisions on labor, but as the, the first speaker said, sex work is not included in the labor catcher. So it basically just eliminates a whole group of women, large numbers all over the world as workers and sees sex work as inherently abusive and unequal. And I said, given Asian histories and the space occupied by sex workers in Japan, in India, in all around Southeast Asia, this is really forcing us to eliminate the whole part of our history and our culture. Um, so it's based on a moral judgment about sex work. Uh, and in a diverse world where there's very different approaches to sex work, um, uh, is that uh, appropriate that you have a global document that does that? So let me uh, end there and uh, leave, it, uh, leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radhika, for that, like, that, 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 ex, that such a great uh, summary of the very many important points that the GR sort of falls short. And I think one of the issues that you did address, which is also I see uh, one of the questions here, is the linkages between the economy trafficking and migration, which is also very important to address within this GR. And I think our next speaker, uh, Bandana Patnaik, is, is, uh, and her area of work would also kind of, I think, allude to some of that. To give a brief bio, Bandana is the international coordinator, coordinator of the Global Alliance Against Traffic of Women and is responsible for the overall coordination of the International Secretariat. Bandana has been with CATW since 1999, doing research, training, and working with self-organized groups. She holds an MA in English Literature as well as an MA in Women's Studies. Bandana, similarly, from your work and, and, and just the knowledge around this, it would be good if you could talk about how you read this particular GR, also paying attention to some of the points that both Philister and Radhika hinted at, but probably you could, uh, you could expound a bit more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Puja. Uh, you know, while, um, yeah, I think I should begin by saying that I agree with everything that Philister and uh, Radhika 
have so well put. So honestly speaking, I really don't have a lot to add, but let me say still. So while reading the GR, the GR 38, I was reminded of my early days at KW. I was in a meeting with uh, sex worker colleagues from Empower Thailand. As we were talking, Bo, one of the sex workers asked me, why is GATW interested in us? Is it because you think we're all trafficked women? I was barely a month old in GATW at that time. But interestingly, I had asked the same question to my colleagues at the office just a few weeks ago. So I'd like to start with you know, what I had learned at that time and what I had shared with our colleagues at Empower on that day to allay their fears and worries about an anti-trafficking alliance. So at GATW, we understand trafficking and we, we, we think that it is absolutely important to delink trafficking and prostitution. The key elements of trafficking are quite clearly explained in the Palermo Protocol, in the negotiation of which GATW had played a very significant role. So by that definition, not everyone in prostitution is a trafficked person. Nor does trafficking happen exclusively into prostitution. Secondly, GATW's human rights approach led us to have a strong faith in the transformative power of organizing. Sex workers were organizing to claim their rights even before GATW was launched. So being in solidarity with them was both logical and ethical for GATW. So looked at from GATW's analytical lens, the CEDAW GR38 is a disappointment. Coming 20 years after the Palermo Protocol, the GR could have done much more. Instead, unfortunately, it has chosen to be regressive and backward looking. The GR does talk about, I mean, it does pay us, make references to the Palermo Protocol. It also makes the right references to the neoliberal paradigm, the neoliberal economic paradigm, restricted migration regimes. It highlights the need for gender transformative and intersectional approach and reminds the states of their obligation to principles of non-discrimination. Technically speaking, however, it makes a confusing mismatch of the Palermo Protocol and the outdated 1949 convention. It chooses to incorporate the criminal justice framework of Palermo, but the core principle of GR 38, I believe, comes from 1949 convention, which conflates trafficking and prostitution and does not define trafficking. So a specific example would be the texts in the GR shuttles between two phrases, exploitation for the prostitution of others and exploitation of prostitution, as though both are the same. Uh, interestingly, and very importantly, the GR emphasizes the need for workers organizing and calls for strengthening labor rights, which is commendable. Uh, and as Radhika pointed out, there are a lot of sort of, you know, like the rights protection mechanisms for trafficked persons are also quite well laid out. That was one of the weaknesses that we had identified many years ago in the Palermo Protocol. However, it does not recognize sex workers as workers and completely ignores organizing among sex workers. By this deliberate, I said deliberate because I know that sex workers had engaged with the CEDAW committee and had made many submissions. So by this deliberate omission, the drafters of the GR have been discriminatory towards sex workers, the very practice that CEDAW actually aspires to eliminate. As for the potential impact on rights holders, it is clear that the GR will have very negative impacts on sex workers' rights. By making a call to the states to criminalize demand, 
It is endorsing an approach that we already know will affect the lives, livelihoods, and dignity of millions of women. In summary, I would like to say that the GR actually was a great opportunity. It could have been, it could have looked at, and, and it lays out very nicely in the introductory parts, the whole context, but it failed to make use of the work that has been done in the area of anti-trafficking in the last 20 years. It fails to recognize the harmful effects of anti-trafficking and it has willfully ignored the anti-trafficking work of sex workers rights organizations. We need to recognize sex workers rights groups as allies in anti-trafficking work and the GR refuses to look at them that way. Over the last 20 years, despite many hurdles, sex workers organizing has gotten stronger. Compared to two decades ago, many more feminist organizations are in solidarity with sex workers rights groups today. The CEDAW committee actually had an opportunity to recognize their struggle for decent work and dignity, but they chose not to. I think I'll stop here, Puja, and... Thank you very much, Vandana, um, also for uh, talking about where and how very many ways the CEDAW committee uh, actually in many ways went almost went back in its own uh, laying down of groundwork around non-discrimination, around autonomy. And, and, and it's important to kind of keep that in mind for the, for the couple of questions that are also coming on the Q&A and for the next round. But just the other lingering, one of the other lingering issue that's been coming through is around uh, the, the criminal law and the criminalization and how various labor frameworks have been incorporated. But, but we also need to talk about how the labor frameworks is so intrinsically linked to corporations. Moving to our next uh, speaker, Archana, uh, uh, Archana Koteja who is, uh, uh, Archana Koteja is a counter trafficking expert and activist with extensive experiences in the area of advocacy policy work and casework related to trafficking in persons. She's recognized as the regional subject matter expert and regularly advises various ASEAN bodies and specialist interagency teams in different countries in the region. As of November, 2020, Archana has assumed the role and foundation, uh, founder of this uh, Remedy Project, a startup social enterprise providing expertise on global supply chain, labor compliance, and remediation mechanism to help workers and businesses redress labor grievances and achieve fair, effective, and enduring positive outcomes. Archana, over to you around just within your work with labor chains, supply chains, and just working with corporates, what do, what do you think the impact of this GR will be? And how do you read this, uh, touching upon the various issues that have already happened? Uh, if you could uh, speak about that, that'd be great. So sure. thank you. Thank you, Puja. And it's a pleasure to be here. I think, you know, as a, as a lawyer, from, from a lawyer's perspective, it was very interesting to see what this GR would bring to the table, particularly from the perspective of jurisprudence building, interpretation, and how this could potentially apply to legal cases and help to clarify uh, and to expand upon some of um, the sort of loose ends left in a sense by the Palermo Protocol, which still comes up when we're working on cases in terms of interpreting the breadth of it, the terms of it, et cetera, and some of the concepts. And, you know, it, um, it was a disappointment in the sense that, you know, there, there was a a fairly chaotic sense through the document, particularly as it conflated trafficking and prostitution, which was problematic um, from the perspective of, of a lawyer and for many others, I'm sure. And the re re reference to the 1949 convention, you know, certainly made me feel that we were going backwards rather than going forwards. The idea of these conventions, the idea of the law is to be interpreted in reflection of the contemporary realities of life, not to be going backwards and, and to deny protection to, the, to those who, who need it. Um, and certainly not for the purposes of interpreting um, any particular agendas or any particular sides of, of discussions. I think there were definitely um, 
there was a disappointment at my end, particularly around the fact that, you know, over the years, everybody has, uh, you know, it, it has been a, a very um, dominant view that the way to approach um, trafficking is very much through a criminal justice lens. And therefore, you know, individuals who are victims of trafficking are often seen as enforcement tools rather than individuals who of their own right, who have agency and who have had bad experiences and, and you know, are, are uh, in need of uh, assertion of their rights, etc. So I was hoping to see some stronger elements of social justice come through uh, the GR, which I felt didn't, and it was still very much looking at the issue from the lens of, of criminal justice. There were some positives, so I think there were progressive recommendations around corporate supply chain and procurement, particularly um, considering mandatory human rights due diligence and the need for a regulatory body that would promote better accountability. Uh, the measures around safe migration, of course, and the acknowledgement of labor trafficking beyond the constant focus on sex trafficking and exploitation. And the victim identification and protection, in particular, the non-criminalization and non-conditionality are very key, particularly as many governments in the region are currently evaluating their identification systems as well. But when it comes to, to for example, you know, the issue of non-criminalization, again, the signals were confusing. Um, the conflation of trafficking and sexual exploitation and prostitution, you know, if you look at that from a labor rights framework, we're basically saying sex workers don't have labor rights. They don't have the right to work in safety. If you look at the jurisdictions across the region where, where we live, in many countries, safe work is legal. But then conflating this um, prostitution with trafficking, et cetera, means that these individuals don't have the right to work safely because you're effectively arguing for criminalizing uh, the demand. I don't feel that the GR was reflective of the hard choices made by women on a daily basis. The choices Radhika alluded to, but also the multiple identities and roles that women play. Um, in some parts of the GI, it felt very much that women were painted as having no agency and as being passive and in need of rescue. I thought the analysis of, of the demand uh, issue was oversimplistic and, and, you know, really had no consideration of the labor trafficking issues in particular. Um, and it, it uh, promoted more criminalization due to a focus on criminalizing demand um, of uh, uh, prostitution. Um, when applied to labor trafficking, the GR starts off well with the introduction challenging neoliberalism and the systemic inequalities and vulnerabilities it fosters. However, for the rest of the GR, including the recommendations and analysis, there is an acceptance of neoliberalism and measures put forward are quite reactive and adapted to this existing model rather than challenging it. I feel this was a missed opportunity to really challenge the fundamentals of inequalities and business models that thrive on systemic coercion um, of the vulnerable. I had hoped to see a bit more of a spirited challenge to the neoliberalist model whilst also outlining the means of reacting to violations that stem from it. I'd like to end by just saying in the course of my work, I meet a lot of women and girls who would classify as victims with a need for rescue pursuant to this GR. This is not, however, how they perceive themselves. And we must remember agency and the fact that women are economic actors, productive members of their communities and families. This GR does not fully represent these women, sex workers, or all the women that it purports to represent. Thank you. Thank you, Archana, for that, uh, for that, uh, for your uh, analysis around how it's looking at labor and also the sort of almost like a disjunction between an analysis around uh, of neoliberalism, but using and critiquing it, but using the same frameworks to uh, to address. So using a framework that is critiqued as a way of addressing uh, a larger issue. But I think. To me, the one of the things that you also said is it, it seems like coming to a round around uh, around bodily autonomy autonomy of women and girls, and then we'll move uh, to our next next speaker to also speak about some of that. Uh, 
who is, uh, and, and just to the next speaker is Ruth, who's been involved in the sex, in sex work for more than 14 years, eight years as full-time sex worker, two and a half years as an academic researcher looking at HIV related risks in the sex industry and more than 30 years as a sex worker rights advocate campaigning for developing and maintaining services and support for sex workers within a human rights framework. Ruth was one of the founding members of the Global Network of Sex Work Projects in 1992 and has been employed as their global coordinator since 2010. She currently co-chairs the UNAIDS Steering Committee on HIV and Sex Work on behalf of NSWP and represents NSWP in the recently formed Sex Worker Inclusive Feminist Alliance, SWIFA. Ruth, if you could talk about how you're reading this, uh, your own reading and understanding of the GR, it'll be great. So, like the other speakers, I was incredibly disappointed that CEDAW did not use this opportunity to embrace all women, cis and transgender women around the world. I'm one of those that's excluded from this protection um, as a sex worker, and I find it incredible that a body that was established within the UN to prevent discrimination, to challenge discrimination, to address discrimination, has actually chosen to discriminate against a substantial number of both cis and transgender women around the world. It's almost as though their ideological position does not even acknowledge our humanity, let alone our bodily autonomy and our agency to make decisions in our own lives. Now, people may not like the decisions that I made in my life, but they don't need to, it's my life. And I made decisions that were in the best interest of myself and of my family, as every woman should be able to do. I find it really incredible that CEDAW Committee has discounted the voices of so many sex workers in this because we have organized. Over the years, we've become stronger. So the global network that I represent has 310 sex worker-led organizations campaigning for sex work to be recognized as work in 95 countries. This is not a global North movement of privileged white women like myself, old white women like myself. This is a grassroots movement coming from women in the global South and the global North who are standing up and asking for their rights. And I find it so disappointing that we are being excluded. We are seen as expendable and disposable by some of the CEDAW committee. I do think that it actually has to be addressed in terms of um, how we do enable the protections that the um, general recommendation offered to migrants. How do we extend them to sex workers? The reality of being a sex worker and a migrant sex worker, for many, they will not identify as trafficked victims because as previous speakers have said, they're used solely as tools in a legal case to um, pursue the traffickers. And when the courts are done with them, they are more often than not removed from the country. So many women who may be on that narrow edge of having been trafficked, do not identify as that um, because they want to be able to earn a livelihood. And I think we have to, in a world that's crying out for the recognition and the respect of diversity, have to have a CEDAW that actually is going to include sex workers. And I use that term proudly, by the way. Thanks, Pooja. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, and I think um, it, it sort of goes to one of the issues that I think we were, we were all discussing. And thank you so much for talking about that is the, what does that mean for us in terms of process? We've heard the, the multiple uh, movements, sex worker movements, all of them speaking about this, coming to the CEDAW committee. And what does it mean about process? when the CEDAW committee discounts the, uh, the, the, uh, the opinions, the choices of, of uh, women who, who have come to CEDAW to talk about that. And what, it, what does it say about accountability? And, and I think that's gonna be one of uh, a next question that we will explore. 
around how 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 do we read this process and is there implications of a process that discounts uh, the the group of people who are one of the most affected and who also know the best about dealing with uh, with trafficking on discounting their voice what does that mean for uh, activist engagement with the committee in the future so i think we're going to begin some of that question we are running a bit late so i might incorporate some of those uh, if the panelists could also read the q and a and i might incorporate some of the questions with specific uh, panelists when they are there but i think the first and foremost we'll will kind of go to priyanti uh, who's the ed of eurasia pacific to talk about just eros engagement and also how how they see the very many processes of the cedo committee uh, on this and thank you priyanti so thank you pooja and thank you to all the speakers who made such uh, very important points in this first uh, half i guess or part of the of this webinar uh, i think at ero we were uh, we experienced a um, number of reactions when we first read the first uh, the final version of the gr uh, disbelief frustration a kind of loud or oh no and a lot of that has to do with the substance and the content of the gr and now knowing how it would impact on women uh, all women everywhere but what i'm going to talk about briefly as pooja has said is uh, how disappointed we are about the process of developing the gr and um, as you know uh, ero has been working with the cedo committee for maybe almost three, uh, 30 years we have facilitated global south women's engagement with the committee at the cedo reviews mainly through our global to local program which has helped the committee to ground their dialogue with state parties in the lived experience of women from different countries several committee members themselves have been part of this program and the feedback we have received over the years has been overwhelmingly positive we have also helped as many of you probably know uh, mobilize women's groups around the development of various general recommendations gr most recently gr 30 or gr 35 and the opportunity to share lived experiences about conflict about gender based violence and to base cedaw's standards relating to these issues on this on this experience was something that was greatly appreciated by the women's groups and the committee members so following the same practice as uh, felicitas said earlier ero uh, with our partners gatw and nswp invested a great deal of time energy and money over the last 2 years engaging with the cedaw committee on gr 38 we made various submissions collectively with other organizations uh, and on our own uh, and most importantly we organized two global convenings um in bangkok uh and in nairobi uh and uh we were where we were able to bring to the table women whose lives will be directly impacted uh by uh this gr uh and also many other people many of the speakers who were who spoke today who are working on the front lines with these communities and who know firsthand about the harms and rights and violations that can actually take place so you can imagine how profoundly disappointed we were uh when we saw that the gr had excluded the voices of almost everyone at those meetings everyone who stated unequivocally and who presented evidence and some of this was in the form of data and analysis and in the form of and the other evidence was in the form of personal life experiences that conflation of trafficking and sexual exploitation and the end demand model can as felista has said make life untenable and dangerous for sex workers I'm sure many of you believe like we do that mandate holders including CEDAW must protect the right of these women and not cause harm. Uh we profess to practice intersectional feminism and that means we do not speak for any marginalized group and we shouldn't further the patriarchy by denying some women their agency. 
And this is what we've been talking about uh, earlier. So we are disappointed when international processes erase the voices of sex workers who are having a tough time surviving in a hostile world anyway. It also raises or reinforces questions many of us have been asking about international advocacy processes and spaces. So what, I, what this really raises for me is whose voices are power holders listening to? Whose information is being privileged over and above the knowledge, experience, and analysis of marginalized groups, sex workers in this instance? Why and how do these processes allow uh, denial and exclusion to happen? I think we are in a world where that is being threatened by, as we've talked about, neoliberalism, colonialism and growing anti-rights movements. And we need to make sure that the CEDAW committee listens to all women without fear or favor and not get captured by these movements. As an organization that has supported the committee's work for all these years, we are concerned about the process that led to the finalization of GR38. Because for me, and I think for my colleagues, it begs the question, if the committee can ignore the voices of sex workers, how can we, what should we do? And how can we ensure that it doesn't make similar exclusions in the future? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Priyanti. And Priyanti made, uh, asked one of the questions that I probably had. And then thank you very much. I think it made my life as whose voices are being privileged and who is being heard. And I think it would be good if all the panelists kind of uh, look at, uh, look at, uh, address that question while uh, talking further. And we will move in the other direction now. So I think the question then, uh, moving to you, Ruth, the question then is, since the committee has ignored the voices of the sex worker movement so significantly, what, how, how, how would you read this? Would, uh, and, and, and what would be some of the things that you would think of doing within the sex worker movement as one of the members of the sex worker movement in this, uh, for, with regard to this GR, it would be great, yeah. So I certainly think that the sex worker community um, mobilized in response to the consultations. I was involved in the very first expert meeting at the start of this process. I attended the expert meetings organized by ERO um, and we mobilized and our community put in written submissions. 20% of the submissions that the CEDAW committee received were from my community around the world. Um, we were adamant that we knew that this recommendation could be a threat to us and mobilized. And yet we're still seen as expendable. We're still silenced in this recommendation. There's a question in the um, section Q&A section that says, how is it discrimination? Um, and I'm surprised to be asked that question in all honesty, um, because the fact that it conflates prostitution, sex work, sexual exploitation, the exploitation of others in prostitution and trafficking is incredibly dangerous for my community. We are being treated differently and that's what discrimination is. The very general recommendation has chosen an ideological position that says we are expendable. Um, and I, I think that um, our frustration at that will not mean that we will not go to CEDAW in the future. NSWP has been working with our members in country, helping them document the discrimination they experience in their countries and helping them draft shadow reports and then go to Geneva and attend the CEDAW sessions for their countries. We will continue to do that. We will continue to amplify our voices we will not be silenced by this general recommendation. And we have a right to be heard. And we will make sure that the voices of sex workers are heard. Thanks, Pooja. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, I think if, uh, I think it kind of, I don't think there's anything more to be added to that. So I'm just going to ask Archana uh, to talk about just her own, uh, her own understanding and, and, and how, how she thinks 
how, how would you look at accountability in this uh, process uh, of the CDAO committee and in, in, in the way the GR was drafted and what was heard and what was willfully not heard? So thank you, Archana. You know, I, I felt extremely privileged when I was invited by ERO to attend the consultations with, with the experts and in order to, to share views with um, the committee mem members on the, the writing of GR uh, 38. And, you know, at that meeting, I was even more um, overwhelmed to see the extremely strong representation of sex worker groups and to hear both from individuals who are sex workers themselves, but also organizers of, of sex workers, et cetera, about their position. I think it was very clear that a lot of effort and organizing had gone into putting views across, whether this was relating to labor trafficking, whether this was relating to sex work, et cetera. Um, some of the views were heard and, and represented, others were not. And, you know, I, for me, as a first timer going through this process, it, it raises a, a couple of important questions. One is about the accountability of the committee itself. Because the, account, the, the committee is there to represent all women. And how do we ensure that they are indeed held accountable for this big responsibility? Because it is a big responsibility. And if organizations are going to mobilize in order to contribute to the development of what could potentially be a very important piece of guidance um, that would influence jurisprudence, formulation of policy or interpretation, then how is it possible and acceptable to a degree that these voices are not heard and represented as they should be? So the next question is, how do we create this degree of accountability? And I think that comes, that comes from two perspectives. One is to look at the composition of the committee itself, the processes involved, the types, profiles of individuals who do end up on these committees and any particular strong views or, or you know, leaning towards one thing or the other. This is particularly relevant in, in a topic like trafficking where uh, being an abolitionist um, you know, can lead to, to, to a very problematic and, and a conflicted position in relation to the formulation of something like this GR. And, and the second thing is, you know, once, once these processes are put in place, what methods of accountability exist to ensure that this position is being used for the benefit of all women. So I think there is, there is a little bit more work that needs to be done on these two fronts in order um, to actually think about how there can be a better formulation of accountability. Because the reality is that this GR is now going to stay with us and we are continue, going to continue to fight on a daily basis. The confusion that create, it creates um, in relation to the interpretation of trafficking, sexual exploitation, and, and prostitution as well. Thanks, Archana. Uh, Bandana, if you could also kind of reflect on the same question, particularly because you highlighted in the first section around the conflation around, and, and organizations and movements that, that work on that. So, what what will then it mean for uh, lack almost the lack of accountability for the movements that the committee represents, and and how should the movements think of this is also okay. from yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Puja. Um, you know, uh, one of the key elements of international human rights standard setting is that it should be consultative, and it should create space for engagement with rights holder. I mean, ILO as the labor rights group has this classic tripartite structure and which enables workers' rights groups to have their say. For other human rights instruments, it's the duty of the concerned body and other people to ensure that voices on the margin must be heard. CEDA, you know, when we think back on it, was the result of the struggle of many women's rights activists around the world. 
women around the world applaud it, appreciate its value, the value of its monitoring mechanism, which we can't say about uh, the ONTOC, for example, the transnationalized, uh, Transnational Organized Crime Convention within which the Palermo Protocol sits. Uh, the review mechanism to Palermo Protocol that we have today can never match the kind of standard that, or the kind of value or the kind of opportunities that the shadow reporting mechanism of CEDAW offers to people. So all women, especially those of us with some privileges, also have a responsibility towards other women who, for multiple reasons, are still not being heard or are being silenced. If we do not do that, we will be guilty of being discriminatory. Inclusion and participation are important, but we also must be mindful that participation and inclusion don't slip into tokenism. So as Priyanti already mentioned, we were one of the several organizations engaged in the advocacy around the GR led by ERO. We participated in the consultation organized by ERO and also at the global consultation. My colleague who was directly engaging in the process was actually very appreciative of the consultative and cooperative consultant who was hired to draft the GR. My colleague also shared with us about the overall chaotic and non-transparent processes at many moments. For example, program of work uh, you know, would be published but changed at the last minute without notice, dates and deadlines were being moved. And uh, you know, sometimes a consultation was taking place Nobody knew who was invited or how a person could get invited. So there were all these problems. And finally, the final GR also deviated from the concept note and from the first draft. In particular, it was supposed to be only about the first part of Article 6, trafficking, and not on the second part, but it decided to include. So there were all these problematic things. Uh, looking so which questions or which makes us concerned about the whole accountability issue. Now, looking forward, what do we do? As Ruth rightly pointed out, the sex workers community are not going to stop engaging with CEDAW. They will continue to engage with CEDAW and they will continue to hold CEDAW committee and the, you know, the thing accountable. So that will go on. And at national level, I think in the shadow reporting processes, the harmful impact of the GR should be documented and critiqued. And um, uh, the last point about uh, you know, what we could do at GATW, for example, because one of the important elements uh, of uh, working in solidarity and being able to sort of communicate with other people in the feminist community who may not be in solidarity with sex workers' rights movement is to create a respectful space for intermovement, intersectoral dialogue, which KW has been doing systematically. And uh, I think that would be a um, sort of, you know, that is something that we at KW commit ourselves to, that we will continue to create these spaces, which would be, we will ensure that these are respectful, respectful, respecting places, and uh, which would kind of, you know, bring different groups of workers, particularly low wage women workers together and build and strengthen the solidarity. I think uh, that's what I would stop at, Puja, if that's all right. Yes, that's perfect. And I think it's always, uh, it's always uh, a, a meeting like this where we can kind of constantly talk about solidarity and how that's such an intrinsic part of accountability, even when we see that not necessarily reflected in the institutions who are supposed to be respecting the same. I think it kind of very uh, nicely goes into uh, the next uh, Radhika to also talk about what accountability then means for the for the mandates and for the for peop people in these international systems. And if you can talk a bit uh, on that, and also I'm going to pull one of the questions from uh, from the question and answer, which also talks about how different UN agencies have different perspectives coming from their own individual opinions. So Radhika, if you could also kind of touch upon that based upon your own experience, just a little bit, uh, and then we'll move to Philista and hopefully have a bit of Q&A, uh, more time for Q&A. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I'm unable to start my video. It says the, the host is not going to. Okay. All right. Start my video. Is that okay? All right. Thank you. Uh, let me just say that uh, I want to agree with Ruth and uh, Archana and say that whatever happens, one has to continue to engage with CEDAW and maybe try and move it and constantly, I mean, at no point should there be uh, a lack of uh, engagement, especially by all of you who are so active in the movement. I mean, uh, so let me begin by saying that. I, I was just recently just reading a book by Annie Ibel Fukushima on migrant crossings on human trafficking in the US. And she talks about the concept of uh, witnessing uh, and uh, what she says is whether we're in the women's rights world or the human rights world, our, our documents, our writings are based on basically witnessing uh, terrible violations. Uh, and um, that's in some ways partial, it's subjective, it's relevant to a narrative, um, and you know we bear witness. And the point is that there are so many witnesses we have the victim, a survivor herself, who, who would be a, a victim, uh, who would be a witness. Then we have intermediaries who, uh, local and uh, international, who would be witness. Then the communities where the women uh, um, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, transgender and cis women, as well as all, all uh, live. Uh, and how they witness the situation. And then there are, of course, state actors. Uh, so an inclusive process must mean that all these voices have to be heard. And uh, the priority given to uh, what I would call the victim survivor. And I think it's really important to understand and represent the diversity uh, of the victim uh, survivor. And I think any legislative process, especially a human rights one at the international level, must be so representative of a diversity and the skill of the drafter and legislator, and I've been in the international system now for over 30 years, is to be able to find the formula that makes all those voices heard. And so that's why I think to some extent one is war, uh, not happy with recommendation 38 because it doesn't seem to attempt to make sure that all those voices are heard uh, uh, and being inclusive of them. Um, and also the question of intermediaries, as you know, Professor David Kennedy has done a major critique of human rights and women's rights movements and saying that they are so influential and more and more depend on whose voices will be heard at the international level. And I know that uh, we are in the women's movement, I think being ex there's an experience where to some extent, the movement has been hijacked with those who are more interested in crime and punishment rather than human rights. I remember when I was, as you know, the first special rapporteur on violence against women, and when we forced it as a human rights issue before the Human Rights Council, all the major human rights, uh, uh, you know, there were men, of course, did not want uh, this as a human rights issue. And their argument was, you're going to make uh, you're going to go into partnership with the state to try and implement uh, anti-violence against uh, in fighting this impunity. And that's a danger zone, uh, the partnership with the state. And though I don't agree with them, I think impunity is a human rights issue and should be fought. There is, I think, something to what they say, because we have now people who are basically not human rights oriented, but who are very much crime and punishment oriented, who are uh, pushing this agenda. And they are the voices that are being heard internationally. And they have got major states and groups of states uh, to support them. Uh, and I think um, they have managed to silence uh, the other voice. And the reason, it, and that is what we have to ensure that in the women's movement, there is, we regain the culture of, 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 of democracy, really, of everybody's voice uh, being heard and to find formulas that allow all voices uh, to be represented. I mean, it was only in the last century that people thought of majority rule and whoever thinks in the majority should win. Now 
we really work toward inclusivity and compromise and consensus that's come out of the multilateral processes themselves and where solidarity is key. And so I think uh, that uh, there's something in that, somehow maybe a way to work toward uh, a women's movement that is more democratic and, and inclusive in putting its views forward uh, and lobbying uh, international uh, organizations. Um, and I think uh, uh, this would be interesting, I think, for Ibra or someone to actually analyze this process uh, and, uh, you know, well, how, uh, how this happened, especially when there were so many really important and vibrant voices of sex workers before it and how the international process could then ignore that voice in, in drafting its final uh, solution. So it would maybe an interesting case study just for the women's movement generally, uh, as I feel, uh, especially both as, a, as working in the field in the UN, as well as, uh, as a teacher, as I read more, uh, I find uh, that we are being overtaken by a kind of crime and punishment framework uh, to a lot of issues that initially began as human rights issues. Uh, and so I think we shouldn't forget that uh, in this discussion. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Radhika. And Muchas gracias, uh, Radhika. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, move to Philista to also maybe uh, give your reflections on this. And I think there was a particular, uh, your reflections around accountability of, of the committee and the process. And also there was a particular question around decriminalization, uh, the distinction between decriminalization and legalization uh, in, uh, on your point. If you have time just to touch upon that, but it's also something that we could send resources on the chat uh, for that as well. So over to you, Philister. thank you. Um, th thank you very much. So I think when it comes to the question of accountability, one of the things as a community person, as a sex worker, I would really um, look at how vibrant the movement of sex workers this time has been, how amount of support um, ERA, NSWP and other women movement have put in into this process and us ourselves, like Ruth has said, as a country, we actually uh, reported uh, shadow reports uh, to CEDO, which had evidences to show, uh, to show how even migrant sex workers are really suffering when they, we work in different countries, how sometimes we get arrested just because of the, conf of the conflicting words between sex work and trafficking. Um, we've seen, um, I think in, in, in the Kenyan report, one of the things that really came out clearly is uh, the murder cases that were really going on. And we, at a time, actually put it in place and say migrants are being murdered in Kenya simply because many of them do not have papers. Um, it is difficult to track uh, the, 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 their families, where they are coming from. This has become an issue and we provided all these evidences as sex in different regions. This, uh, as Ruth has said, yes, it is a long and a very expensive process, but as sex workers, we are still committed. But again, we are asking ourselves, how accountable is the committee? How committed are they to look at different women issues? Because women are coming from different careers. Not all women are lawyers, not all women are doctors. Not all women are housewives. Some women have made different choices like us sex workers. Is this a platform uh, for all women? Is this a platform where all voices of the women are heard? Because these are many of the questions that I still have as a community person who has been denied a right, who has, whose voices has been, been denied to be heard. And 
this is very complicated because when I saw when the recommendations come out, I was actually very disappointed because personally I was really engaged into the process and the issues in countries are real. People are really facing real uh, issues in country. Somebody is asking about difference between legalization and decriminalization. As sex workers, we, are, we want decriminalization because all we want is a safe working environment. All we want is sex work to be work just like any other work, because that's what we believe in as, uh, as sex workers. As for the definition, I'm going to type it, type it in in the typing box so that we can be able to continue with this chatting. But my question is, if we have such recommendations coming from body like a body like CEDO, are we really looking at sex work being decriminalized at our own countries? Because such reports, our governments can actually be using them against us. So I think we really need to rethink. I don't know. I'm not sure about the engagement anymore because I think we did. It is something that we will continue doing. It is something that we are giving ourselves out into engaging with. But I think also something deep needs to be done about the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for this such a brilliant uh, panel and your inputs. And I actually have so many more questions that I could ask and, and, and kind of have this discussion. But I know we're, const uh, we're constrained by time. Um, um, and and th there have been a list of questions on the chat box. And if I can request all the panelists who can to maybe turn their videos on, we could take like uh, two minutes uh, for everybody to have their final remarks and I'll summarize the questions and we can uh, take go around it so everybody can have uh, can have a, a uh, give their end comments on, on these questions. And I think uh, a couple of the questions were formed around what one can do, uh, particularly around allyship for sex worker movements. What are, what are the possible avenues uh, to that? And there was, a, there was a few questions on that. I think there were, there were a few questions around, I'm just summarizing it here. There were questions around root causes, trafficking, and, and sort of looking at macroeconomics, like what that involves, just in terms of uh, the linkages, if, if, if people could. And I know it's a huge thing to talk about So in, in one minute. So whoever, uh, just an attempt would be good. <laughs> I am going to I am going to say like some of the questions which felt like they are or they've already been answered by the panelists either on either in the presentations or otherwise I think they've been covered in since the entire panel is about listening to women and their and and what they have to say and the panelists it it doesn't for us make uh, a lot of uh, isn't in, in good form to keep asking the same questions just because we are not willing to listen properly. Uh, so uh, in that way, if people can uh, focus on these two particular uh, chunks of questions around root causes, trafficking, and around allyship and what can, what can be done. And any other last thoughts you have? I'm going to time this very mm -hmm. strictly. So I'm thinking a minute each if possible. Thank you very much. And I'm going to start with maybe uh, just going the way we went last uh, time. So Philister get some time, uh, a bit of a break. Mm. So Priyanti, do you want to uh, go first? Yes, thank you, Pooja. I uh, feel like I would like to talk to the question of allyship because I feel that this raises a question for me about uh, all all women who, whose voices are not heard generally and who are now increasingly seeing CEDO as a space to uh, claim their rights when they are being constrained in their own national contexts. And I think uh, we need to figure out uh, uh, that uh, not only how to uh, have the voices of sex workers heard, but also the voices of other people who may also uh, face the same situation if the committee goes on on this vein. So I think there were some uh, other fellow uh, panelists said some things about the composition of the committee, the need to regain the culture of democracy, uh, the uh, need to analyze how this happened and how this kind of, uh, and to make sure that uh, some of the gaps get uh, 
stopped or plugged. So I think these are the things that we I would like to take forward uh, within our sphere of involvement with the committee because we are not really ready to, we're not about to discard the CEDAW committee. We've had a long history with them and we would like to make sure that uh, they work for the rights of all women everywhere. So thank you. Ruth? So um, I want to touch on both of them very, very quickly in terms of allyships. The sex worker movement realized a number of years ago that we needed to try and engage more within the women's movement and look at how do we advance sex worker rights within that movement as women, both cis and transgender women. Um, and we will continue to do that as well as trying to actually build further links with the labor movement, with trade unions, because we are workers and we want workers' rights. I think we also, uh, my board, and when I say we, I do mean my board is telling me to, has asked me to also try and develop allyships with religious leaders, because there are religious leaders who actually do see us as human beings and not just sinners to be saved, but actually understand that we make difficult choices. And I come into the root causes because we live in a capitalist society. I'm not a great fan of it, um, but this is one of the ways that many women choose to make a living. I, I read the question about those that are forced into prostitution. All of us within a capitalist system, unless we're one of the top dogs, are forced into working for money. Okay? I made my choices. You may not like them. But they were my choices. And believe me when I say going into sex work was my best option that was open to me. Now, that is not desirable. I'd love to see a society where people did not live in poverty. It isn't just sex work, though. That is not a good form of employment, if you want to think of it as that. But it is the one that is always picked out as being unacceptable for a human being to choose. And I would ask you all to challenge why you think that I am unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Archana. You know, as a, as, a, as a labor rights lawyer, I think I'd like to say that, you know, I'd like to see an expansive view of labor rights being taken. And, you know, the, the inclusion of all different forms of work that women choose and that their choice be honored as individuals who are autonomous and who have the right to make the choice over what profession or what they choose to do. And, and the second thing is, you know, I'd really like to see the emergence of a social justice approach as opposed to the criminal justice focus and lens, which has lended so clearly to having a victim that needs rescuing, an offender that commits the offense and has therefore skewed a lot of the interpretation of women, their agency, and you know, what role they have to play in our communities and, and in our societies. And that has fueled a lot of discussion around demand, et cetera, which only leads to the criminalization of women and nothing else. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And I do hope that this brings renewed opportunity to really think about accountability um, about true representation and about inclusion as well. Thank you. Thank you, and Vandana. Um, thank you, Puja. Um, you know, um, talking about the root causes, uh, yes, it's important to think about and discuss the about the root causes. Sometimes we say, the root of the roots of the root causes. So whatever that might be, I mean, as, as Ruth rightly pointed out, as Priyanti mentioned already, as all the speakers have already talked about, we are living within a system that is anti-poor people, anti-people in general, anti-poor people, and it that it believes in creating a, a system where a number of people would be excluded. But the question here is, how are we going to be able to address it 
if we want to, we ourselves, we divide ourselves and we exclude certain groups of people just because they don't fit our idea of what is right or what is you know, ethical or what is moral. So we won't be able to achieve the change that we want, the better world that we want to see if we divide ourselves and we exclude other people. So absolutely, so solidarity building is absolutely necessary at every stage. So among different people. So I think that's something that I would like to see that we learn uh, to practice within our feminist communities that we recognize that we may disagree, but that doesn't mean that we will throw, because you disagree with me, I'll close the door. And you know, so I think that needs to stop. I, I'd stop there, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Radhika and then Philista. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me just be brief. I mean, I think we can't underestimate the role that CEDO has played in, 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 in women's rights and women's movements in the last three decades, and there's no need to uh, stop uh, now. But I think when I think of allyship, strangely, uh, in the, that protocol, uh, that convention, uh, even though it's all, many people can critique it or whatever. In the end, all the various groups agreed uh, to the draft to some extent. I mean, they were, but there was a general that they can live with it. Uh, and, and, and I think that kind of uh, working uh, together or tolerance or whatever, we should try and uh, work toward that, I think, within the women's movement generally, because we, I, I don't know, it's becoming very uh, divided. And I don't know whether we need to open a dialogue within the women's movement for the different uh, approaches and uh, somehow uh, come together on some agreed uh, sets of criteria for protecting the human rights of women, recognizing uh, that some communities, there are women who want to do sex work and should be protected and have the right to do so. I don't know, has the dialogue stopped? I'm, I have not been in the movement, so I've been out of it, but somehow that dialogue, whether that can begin, uh, I don't know. Uh, but maybe I'm pie in the sky, but I was just thinking perhaps that's, that's something, some way forward. Uh, but the second uh, thing about root causes is whatever some women choose, even of wealthy families, to, to do sex work. But I think that we cannot forget uh, that women have the right, uh, especially if you've imposed an economic system on them uh, and there's poverty and, and, and uh, terrible uh, uh, realities for them, that they have the right to choose their survival strategies. And actually, if you stop those strategies, uh, is not only an issue of morality, but really just refusing, uh, denying them existence. Uh, and so I think to some extent, we have to really protect uh, the right of women to do uh, domestic work, sex work, factory work, but with labor and other protections. We must stop abuse and violations until, unless we can get rid of the exploitive system altogether. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, we're going to call, come to a close with Philister's last, uh, last few words. And I think it's, and just to say, thank you very much to Ira and all of you to, uh, for giving us uh, this time and for having this discussion. And a great, a big thank you to the interpreters uh, all of the interpreters to making this uh, solidarity discussion happen. And, um, and, and it's been a privilege to be a part of uh, this, this, this fantastic group of women. And once uh, after Philister's last word, I think we're gonna come to a close. Uh, apologies if not all the questions have been answered, but uh, I've been told Philister has uh, dropped off because of internet, which is, which is very unfortunate, but which is really, uh, but I think uh, I was on the way of closing, but just to say, thank you very much. It's been such an honor to be a part of this group and we hope to have this discussion continuing and thanks very much to Ira for this wonderful, uh, for giving us this opportunity.